Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to work on 13.2 guided reading, and this section is titled Europe Plunges into War. So the way that this guided reading is set up is that each box has a cause that they give you, and then we've got to talk a little bit more about what the effects were from each of those causes. So the first cause we're going to talk about is Russia mobilizes along the German border. As we talked about before, if you mobilize your army, that means you move them uh, and your supplies, that's weapons, um, different kinds of guns. Later on in the war, we're talking about aircraft, but we're also talking about food supplies, hospital supplies, so on and so forth. So moving all that towards where you're going to fight, that's what we call mobilization. So Russia mobilizes along the German border. Border is the cause, the effects, can um, probably figure it out if you haven't already. Germany is going to declare war on Russia and France. Now Germany goes on to declare war not only on Russia but also France because they don't want to get trapped in a two-front war. They don't want to have to fight to their east where Russia is and to their west where France is. And so they know that Russia and France are together in an alliance and that in case of a war they're probably going to have to fight both and so when Russia's mobilizing an army. The Germans feel they have no choice but to declare war on both sides and they're going to try to knock out one of them before the other and we're going to talk about that a little bit later so that they can avoid a two-front war. So the next cause we're going to talk about is how Germany declares war on France. Because of this, um, it's going to kind of lead to another part in this chain of this chain reaction. And so this picture does a great job of illustrating that. All the way to the left, that smaller guy that you have there saying, if you touch me, I'll. This is kind of where it gets started. That's supposed to represent Serbia. And behind his shoulder is a figure that represents the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And behind his shoulder is a figure that represents the Russian Empire. And behind him, the German. Behind him, the French. And then you can always tell when an artist is trying to de depict the British because they use very British words such as chaps. And so you can see how this is one led to the other, led to the other, led to the other, led to the other in terms of nations declaring war on each other. So our next cause is going to be how the Allies defeat the Germans in the Battle of the Marne. Now this picture here does a great job of illustrating, as it states, the Schlieffen Plan. As I mentioned before, Germany was afraid of a two-front war. They didn't want to fight France to the west and Russia to the east. And Germany's plan is to first knock out France and then devote most of their resources, including troops and ammunitions and supplies, to the east to defeat the Russians. They wanted to take out the French first because A, they thought they could do it quicker, and B, the Russians, they thought, were going to take longer to mobilize. So the Schlieffen Plan says, go in and knock out France. And you can see those dotted lines and arrows represent different troop maneuvers getting towards Paris, but also then blocking off and taking over the whole of France. If you look and see where they need to go through in order to do that, it's Belgium. Now the Schlieffen Plan didn't work. Once the Germans got to within Paris, but then we, is, that's where we have the Battle of the Marne, and the Germans are actually stopped and they're pushed back towards Belgium and towards uh, their homeland in Germany. So the Schlieffen Plan is stopped because the Allies, that's France and somewhat England, are able to stop the Germans at the Battle of the Marne. This also has another effect now. Germany has to fight a war on two fronts. And this is exactly what Germany was trying to avoid. And this map does a decent job of illustrating how Germany was now going to have to devote resources to the west and to the east in order to try to stop these two um, strong military powers, France and Russia, from defeating them. So the next cause is... Um, how we have machine guns, tanks, poisonous gas, and airplanes, and how they're used in battles along the Western Front. That has a very chilling effect. Um, you can see kind of what we're getting at from this picture here, and notice that mud that those men are trying to get through. One of the side effects of um, trench warfare is the, how it destroys all the vegetation and just creates really muddy, mucky terrain. 
But the effect that we're talking about here is that we have some huge numbers of casualties. Sometimes you have 20,000 or even more that die in a single day. Uh, I'm sorry, casualties are die or are maimed or, or mutilated by the enemy fire so much that they can't fight anymore. So you have huge numbers of casualties well, mounting on each side because of these new technological advances in the guns that they're using, the gases that later become illegal um, at times, and the tanks and planes all contribute to these huge numbers of casualties. The other thing that these this technology contributes to is the way that the war was fought. It turns into this huge stalemate. So a stalemate develops with trench warfare, and a stalemate is when both sides are locked and neither can advance or move against the other. So it's kind of like this deadlock, no real progress going on um, as the two sides dig in trenches on either side. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Here's some other illustrations of um, what it was like to be in those trenches. You can see in some places people had huddled down so that they were out of the rain of fire from their enemies. You can also see barbed wire there that was there to um, be able to tangle up the enemy so you'd be able to shoot them while they're trying to get across. Here's another illustration of some British soldiers kind of hanging out making battle plans or deciding where might be the best place to attack in their trench. Um, this is obviously not during a battle but this is kind of the lifestyle and part of what people had to live uh, when they lived in the trenches over these years during the war. Our next cause is um, that Russian forces attack both Austria and Germany. So once Russia, who by the way were able to mobilize a whole lot faster than the Germans had calculated, once they attack and get, they start to gain some land in Germany and a bit in Austria, but they don't really hang on to that over time. What happens is the Germans launch counterattacks. So they send some of their resources uh, from the west to the east and they are able to repel the Russians. As a result of this, Russia is forced to retreat. So the Russians start to uh, lose that territory that they had gained uh, in the eastern front of the war. Um, Germany regains East Prussia, which is a region that was very important to Germany that the Russians were able to take over. And eventually, as well, the Austrian forces are able to drive the Russians out of their territory too. Um, and you have this kind of series of Russian retreats which kind of get blurred together. They're actually not the worst retreats in the world, but one thing that was happening was literally as some of the Russians were running from uh, German advancements, they left giant piles of weapons and supplies that they had stockpiled behind them. And so this retreat was costly not only in territory, but also in supplies and weapons. And later that's really going to hurt Russia as they run low on supplies. Finally, number six, this cause is the Allies are unable to ship war supplies to Russia's ports. By the Allies, we mean the British. And we also are focusing on the French. Later, uh, the United States gets involved. But they're having trouble getting the supplies to Russia's ports. So... What happens is, since Russia is not as industrialized as these other countries, they start to become very short on supplies. You hear or read about stories of Russian soldiers going to the front lines without coats, without boots or blankets, without rifles even, and they're there just to pick up things from some of the other dead soldiers. It's not the best situation you want to be in to fight the German, the mighty German army at this time. As a result of this, a, a further effect is that eventually Russia collapses without the supplies they need because they're not able to produce uh, weapons and food for the battlefronts as quickly as the other nations. Eventually, Russian support for the war goes way down and people start to turn against the government. Eventually, you get to the Russian Revolution. Uh, and here's a picture of Lenin, and then that is not I am the walrus. That is Vladimir Lenin, who eventually leads one of the takeovers later in that year in October of the Russian government and this is where we start to see a real change into a communist Russia. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. We'll catch you next time.